But, um, you know, the last few weeks I've really been trying to make you guys uncomfortable, right? And I don't know how that's going for you, but uh, we've been talking about uncomfortable church. And so um, I think it's important that we, um, <clears throat> that we um, get pushed out of our comfort zones. I, I'm about to get off topic, so I'm going to get back, or back off, on tra- off track. So I'm going to get back here with my notes and kind of kind of think about that. But you know, so far we've talked about the uncomfortable relationship with Jesus. Because when you choose to follow Jesus, you basically surrender to him to go and do whatever he says, right? And so uh, that can be somewhat uncomfortable. But uh, we ought to find a lot of comfort in that, really, you know, because we love him and and uh, we trust him. And then last week we talked about uncomfortable places. And we took a look in John chapter 4 and uh, about the encounter with a woman at the well. And we're going to go back there today and we're going to uh, talk about uncomfortable conversations. And we're going to look at this text just a little bit more. But um, So I tell you what, let's just, let's just read it together. Um, Let's start at verse 7. We left, uh, Jesus had stopped at the well because he was thirsty. And now in verse 7 of John chapter 4, God's word says this. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And then there's a note. It says his disciples had went away in the city to buy food. So it's just those two. And the Samaritan woman then said, how is it that you, being a Jew... Ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. A lot of different levels here. We'll talk about those. We've talked about a lot of this before. But I, uh, and then, then there's a note here, I guess, from John as he pens his gospel. He says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So, you know, so uh, we've talked about that. We'll get into a little bit more of that. But Jesus answered her and he said this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And then the woman said to him, Sir, you, you don't have anything to draw water with, and the well's deep. Where do you get this living water? And she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right? uh, you know, I, I created Jacob, by the way. But, uh, but she says, he gave us this well and drank from it himself, and as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said, there, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir... Give me this water so that I won't be thirsty and I won't have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, he changes the conversation a little bit. He says, go call your husband. And uh, the woman responds and she says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. And the woman then said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You know what that means? That means Jesus was right. <laughs> you know, he knew stuff about her that, uh, that uh, he shouldn't have known, I guess. And so she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say in Jerusalem is the place to worship. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming, whether neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And he says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Norman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who's called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. That's what Jesus had just done in a sense to her, wasn't it? And so Jesus said to her, I guess plainly, he says, I who speak to you am he. And about that time the disciples came back, they marveled that Jesus was talking with a woman. And no one asked him, who, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar, went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, 
we're so thankful today for this story. Lord, for the interaction that Jesus has with this woman and Lord, the truth that it reveals and the example that it gives us to follow. Lord, we pray today that you would enlighten us. Lord, convict us of sin. Help us to see this truth. And Lord, help us to be willing to step out of our comfort zones to follow you into uncomfortable places and be willing to have uncomfortable conversations. Bless us today. And we ask that all in the precious name of Jesus, Lord. Your will be done. All right, so Jesus kind of puts this woman of Samaria in an uncomfortable place, doesn't he, with his conversation. And, and um, have, you ever, have you ever had an uncomfortable conversation? You know, I, I mean, we have them all the time, really, probably, but, but um, I just happened to think of one, and I thought, would you want to hear a story about an uncomfortable conversation about me from my youth, from my childhood days? I, I tell stories on myself, and I... And as far as I know, it's true, okay? <laughs> well, it is true, it's the best I can remember. But when I was a kid, um, this happened, I, I, was, I was probably three or four years old, and I, I, I do remember it, I, I remember it plainly, but uh, as plainly as I, I remember it, I remember it plainly. But, uh, <laughs> but we, there was this store, it was a little over a mile from our house it, uh, on 68. I grew up near Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, and out on 68 going toward Watts Bar, and and there used to be this store on the left, just past the, uh, the church, and uh, it was called Daniel's uh, Store back then, and, and uh, it's just, you know, a little country store, and, and we'd go in there three or four times a week, probably, you know, just to get stuff that we forgot, because it's so long, far to town, you know, I mean, it's like eight or ten miles in Sweetwater, so, so um, as most children do when they enter a store with their parents, you know, they immediately start begging for candy you know or cokes and this kind of thing and and so uh, most of the time the first response I knew would be no right and and so you know you, you know how it is and and so um, but usually after uh, faithfully following the model of the persistent widow in the bible you know uh, of pleading and pleading and pleading I would get something you know and, and a lot of times my mom would say you know even, no matter where we were you know it has to be under a dollar so now, pretty much nowadays, you can buy anything. But back then, there were some things that you could buy. And one of the things I really liked to get a lot of times that was pretty cheap was those little chocolate footballs. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I've not really seen them much lately, but I think they're still out there and about. But if I remember out there, they were only like a penny or two cents maybe, or a nickel, you know, a piece. Or maybe it was a nickel for two or three or something. I don't remember. But but they weren't a whole lot. And, and um, so... But this time, when I went in the store, I, I kept hearing no, and there was always no, and there wasn't going to be a yes, and I knew where, where there wasn't going to be a yes. And, of course, I was eye level, pretty much, with the candy footballs. And uh, so I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to get me a few. So I grabbed one or two or ten. I don't, I don't remember, to be honest with you, how many I had. But, but what I do remember is when I got, made it to the back seat of the car successfully, I thought it was safe to open a few of them. And, you know, my mom with her ultrasonic hearing or supernatural ability to smell or, or, or whatever it was, you know, she detected right away that something was going on. She turned around, here I am, you know, mid-throw. And uh, she said, where did you get that? So I knew immediately I was in trouble, but I, I just told the truth. I said, I got it in the store. She said, we didn't pay for that. And she immediately grabbed me. She gave me a little blessing out about how we don't steal. And to be honest with you, I don't even know for sure if I knew I was stealing. But um, then I had to go in. And after having that little uncomfortable conversation, I had to go back in the store. And then we had to pay for whatever I'd eaten. <laughs> Probably broke us, you know. <laughs> but what hurt the most was when I had to tell the store owner that I was sorry that I stole from him and I, I I don't remember what all I had to say but and I was just repeating whatever mom told me to say but I was, I was really uncomfortable I, I'm sure he probably couldn't understand a word I said because I was probably mid ball you know 
But that was uncomfortable. And uh, you know what's weird about it is when Christy and I met and we started dating is she stole candy footballs too. <laughs> but at a different store and almost the exact same scenario, probably about the same age, she stole from Bellamy's over here in Sweetwater. And, and so I'm surprised we've not raised a whole brood of thieves. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so, you know, in this story, you kind of get a little sense of... Uh, you know, we have, well, you see, we have some sin, and we have uncomfortable conversation. And when there's sin, there needs to be an uncomfortable conversation. Where there's sin, there needs to be an uncomfortable conversation. And it's going to be uncomfortable for the sinner, <laughs> right? And, and so, um, one of people's biggest fears today is called imposter syndrome you know what it, what it means is people are afraid of being found out and so what we have a tendency to do is try to hide stuff and when we do something wrong we don't want anybody to confront us about it we don't want anybody to know about it so we try to try to sweep things under the rug but there's this whole thing it's imposter syndrome and you know it's basically just a fear of being uh, exposed as a fraud you know that, that you're you put out this perception that this is who you are and you don't want anybody to know that you really aren't as smart as you hope people think you are or you know and this kind of thing and and what, what we do I think a lot of times is we really don't want people to know that we're really as sinful as we are you know we try to we try to hide that we uh, we're imposters we're all of us are, are a lot more sinful than we really want people to think we are and and, um, you know, everyone has some deep, dark matters that are in their hearts and in their minds and maybe in their closets that they don't want anybody to know about. And they hope nobody ever finds out. But the problem is this. God knows. He already knows. He knows more wrong about you than you know is wrong about you. You know, He knows everything. <laughs> but the best part of that is, you know what, He loves you anyway. He can't love you any more than he already does. Even though he knows your deepest, darkest secrets. And, and uh, you know, and he's the only one that really matters, really. You know, so, uh, and you can't hide it from him. But Daniel 2.22 says that God reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. You see, God, God you know, dwells in inapproachable light. And when he casts his light out, there's nothing hidden from him. And, and today in our text, we see an uncomfortable situation. But, G, you know, this woman has some sin in her life, doesn't she? And, 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 but Jesus sees it. He knows all about it. And he talks to her anyway. You know, it, it's all of this that, that's coming out. Uh, you know, it probably wasn't an uncomfortable pro, uh, uh, conversation for Jesus. But if you or I had been the one doing it, we would have probably been a little bit uncomfortable. And there's a lot of reasons why it, it's uncomfortable. And we make excuses uh, why we should not have conversations with people. And most of the time we don't try to have conversations with people that will make us uncomfortable or that will make them uncomfortable. We live in a day where nobody wants to make anybody else uncomfortable. Don't we? But guess what? People need to be uncomfortable in their sin. They need to know that Jesus can deliver them. And we need to stop petting people with sin and start telling them the truth that sin will send you straight to hell. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I'm getting so sick of churches and Christians who are baby rubbing sinners. Now I'm not telling you, look, we're, we're not going to judge them. You know, and, and be just, we're all part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. But I know somebody who can deliver you. So let me tell you about him. That's the truth. And when Jesus approached this woman, he wasn't just, you know, he didn't come to judge her. He come to save her. And uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But what I want to do is I want us to look at the, this text. And you know, there were just three reasons that this conversation in our text had the potential to to make this woman uncomfortable. And 
and, and to make us uncomfortable if we're, we're, we're sharing it. So I want to share those with you. And let's just talk about those. Number one is this. You know, conversation can be uncomfortable when it's with a person you don't like. And so we already know, we've talked about this. When you look at the text, and you know, the Samaritan woman, her first question when Jesus asked her to give him a drink, she says, how can you, a Jew, be asking me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? And we know, you know, first of all, Jesus was talking to a woman. And we saw when the disciples come back, when you read down in the text, they're like, ooh, Jesus is talking to a woman. Ooh, in public. He's, ooh, you know, what's that about? I mean, they were confused. Because men didn't talk to women in public those days, you know. But not only was he talking to a woman, he was talking to a woman of Samaria. And see, the Jews, we already know, if you've been around, hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a mixed race of people, part Jew, part Assyrian. And so, you know, what I'm talking about today, it, a lot of it, you know, just has to do with racism. They just hated them because of who they were. They weren't like them. They were different. They had were a different color, maybe, or, you know, just a different ethnic group. And, and you know, it, listen to me for a second. Now, nobody in here today, I guarantee you, if I went around and I asked everyone, you, one by one, almost everyone, 99.9% .9 of you probably say, oh, there's nobody I hate. And I hope that's true, but, but um, a lot of times we live like we hate them because we don't, you know, maybe because they're a different color or, or a different uh, nationality or whatever, we don't really engage them. We don't befriend them. We don't try to love them, you know, we don't try to talk to them, we don't have conversation with them, we don't build relationships with them a lot of times, and, you know, but, but listen, when you hate somebody because of their skin color or their nationality or their tribe or because they're from that holler or this holler, that's racism, that's just, that's just pure hate, and, and there, listen to me, there's no room for racism in God's church, there's no place for it. There's one race of people in this, or there's two races of people in this world, really. Those who are saved and those who are unsaved. That's it. And we ought to love them all. You know? And we ought to love all those who are redeemed as our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to do our best to try to love those who are not saved into the family of God, all right? Uh, but, you know, Jesus loves everybody. He don't care what color you are. He don't care where you're from. He don't care who you're from. You know, uh, most of us Americans in the 21st century, it's amazing to me that any American could be racist because, you know, uh, because we come from so many different types of people, we can't really even claim a single group. Hardly any of us can. We don't even know what we are. A lot of us, you know, I mean, we're so mixed up. Why in the world would you want to identify with a worldly group anyway if you're a Christian? You know, why? I mean, I get caught up in it too. I mean, I know because of my surname that my family hails from Ireland before that. Who knows? You know? So, I mean, does it matter? But, you know, I find some interest in that. But more than anything, I want to identify as a son of God, a child of God, you know. And so if you belong to Christ, let me tell you something. You're the same family. There's no room for hate among those who are, the, uh, those who are his. And God has called us to make disciples in the Great Commission of all ethnos. And that, that word's where we get our word ethnic from. And it means every people group throughout the world. Or it can mean nations. And so it includes all groups of people, wherever they are. And even when there are cultural differences or racial differences as the world defines them and other things that may be there that, that might make us uncomfortable, you know what? We still have a command from King Jesus to intentionally love those people and have conversations with them that will invite them into a relationship with us and with King Jesus. Amen? We, we should be doing that, and we should intentionally do that. And, and so, you know, Jesus had no problem entering Samaria and engaging a woman, which would have been taboo, like I said, but not only did he engage a woman in conversation, but he engaged a Samaritan woman. 
And listen, folks, if we are going to love like Jesus, we must be willing to intentionally befriend and love people who are different from us. I tell you, we need to. You know, one of the focuses of this church, one of the burdens of my heart, was to be a diverse church in this community. I mean, I really didn't know if there was one who was really diverse. And I don't think we're there yet. Not where I wanted to be. But I wanted a church where anybody could come and feel welcome and loved and accepted. And that, that's what we ought to be. That's what every church ought to be. Uh, and so, church, we need to make a decision. As individuals and as a body of Christ, to go to those people who are different from us and have sp spiritual conversations with them intentionally so that we can lead them to Jesus, so they can have fellowship with the Father and fellowship with the family, become a part of who we are in Christ. And so, a lot of times, maybe we're uncomfortable. <laughs> we got to break out of that comfort zone. And intentionally engage in uncomfortable conversations. All right, with lost people, no matter who they are. Number two, another, another reason that we can get uncomfortable with the conversation, and, and this, is, this is basically, you know, because it, it's somewhat by that we disagree with. And mainly what I saw in this passage, we're talking about theology. Spiritual truth. And, and when we read this passage, you know, this Samaritan woman, she wanted, when Jesus started trying to engage her and talk to her about living water and, and, and worshiping God in spirit and truth and that kind of thing, whatever, she's, she's trying to change the subject. And she says, look, you, you guys say, you know, the place to worship is in Jerusalem, but we say we worship here on this mountain. And um, so then Jesus says, look, there's coming where it won't matter where you're going to worship, you know. But look what he says. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. But he says, for salvation is from the Jews. So now he's, he's lining it up, right? And, and this is the kind of thing that happens to us a lot of times. We, we want to get in an argument with the Presbyterians or the Methodists or, you know, some other group of doctrinally a little bit different than us and and we want to argue with them about what's right and what's wrong. But you know what? A lot of that stuff don't matter. The main thing that matters is salvation's from the Jews. And his name's Jesus. All right? And that's where he's getting down to the That's the main point. And, and we can, we can uh, debate in love and grace. And, and you know, and, and there ought to be some of that. But... But then he talks about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And then he reveals himself as the Messiah to her. You know, see, the Samaritans, they, they, they pretty much, they were kind of like the Sadducees. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's all they followed. They just forgot all the rest, all the prophets. And so even though they knew the Messiah was coming, there wasn't a whole lot in their scripture that really pointed to the Messiah. There's some, obviously, you know, we've looked at some of it, but, but their belief system was quite different than the Jews. And um, while the woman wanted to argue about spiritual differences, Jesus wanted to point her to the main thing, the one thing that mattered. And that's who's the Messiah. You know, who's going to deliver you? And, that, and, and, and so he intentionally engaged this woman to reveal the truth of Scripture. You know, and ultimately it doesn't matter where you worship. And I've told a lot of people, I can worship God anywhere nearly. I mean, I can go into any church. I don't care how dry the preaching or the music is. There's something in there that's, in, that's scriptural. I'm going to have some worship. I will. I might not enjoy it as much as I do other places, but I'm going to worship God. Because, you know, it doesn't matter to me what kind of music we sing or what kind of lights we have or what kind of chairs we got. What, you know, I'm more in tune with what's he saying and is it scriptural? And if it is, I'm going to say amen. And I'm going to try to hear from God. And, and, you know, and, and that's what matters. Uh, you know, uh, uh, whom you worship is the center of the matter. And, you know, we live in a world that's full of, <laughs> there's a vast supply 
of theological beliefs, aren't isn't there? I mean, even atheism is a form of religion. You know, I mean, they got more faith than we got. You know, when you think about it. Uh, uh, but, but um, folks want to argue about who's correct uh, all the time, and and when and when you when you talk about differences, a lot of times it gets real uncomfortable, doesn't it? You know. Uh, there's certain groups when they get together or when your family, maybe there's some folks in your family that are a little bit different denominationally, a little bit different belief system. And, and I've been involved in some pretty intense conversation. You know what I mean? But let me tell you something. What I want you to focus on, you know, is this fact. Jesus said the salvation is from the Jews. Jesus said the, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Tell them about Jesus. Let them see Jesus. That's, that's the main thing, you know. Jesus made it clear to this Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah. He was the unique, anointed one. The one from God. The one who, and, you know, and I don't know for sure what their understanding of the Messiah was. It might have been just as mixed up as the Jews was. Probably even worse. But, you know, one of the things that I've run into with a lot of people, and I hear it a lot, is, you know, it's a popular saying, really, is people say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in God, you're going to be okay. Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Maybe you felt that way before, you know. And a lot of times we're doing, and, and, you know, and uh, listen, there's a lot of things. It doesn't matter what you're wrong about, but don't be wrong about Jesus. All right? Because if you're wrong about Jesus, it doesn't matter what else you're right about. You know? It doesn't. And, but the fact that, that people say, oh, well, you, you know, as long as you believe in God, you'll be all right. Well, that's not true. Uh, James uh, chapter 2 and verse 19 says that the devils believe in God and they tremble. And it ain't helping them. You know? They ain't going nowhere, you know, except to hell, you know, forever. They're doomed for destruction. And let me tell you something. Unless you believe on Jesus by grace through faith alone in his death, burial, and resurrection, you are condemned to destruction too. But the difference is you can believe. You can hear the truth. And you can respond in faith. And you can be changed. And you can be delivered. That's why we need to have conversations with these people who don't know Jesus. You know, our world is filled with billions, with a B, of people who have not yet heard the gospel. And believe it or not, some of them are right here in our, in our town or in our county. Or in the Fellowship Valley. You know, I mean, who's going to tell them? You know what it takes? An uncomfortable conversation. Some of you feel the Holy Spirit of God drawing you to your neighbors and your co-workers. Or maybe just a fellow shopper at Walmart or Ingalls or wherever you go. And you know that the Holy Spirit is wooing you to speak to that person. And you snuff it out. No, don't do it. Follow the Spirit. Let Him lead you. Let Him open your mouth and you declare the truth. I'll, as uncomfortable as it may be to talk to a stranger or your best friend or your closest relative about the love of Jesus, do it. Do it. Step out of your comfort zone and have that spiritual conversation. Those people who believe differently than you, they need Jesus too. You know, they do. So who's going to tell them? Maybe it's you. So uncomfortable conversations, you know, they can be uncomfortable because of racism. They can be uncomfortable because of theology. Another reason that we may be uncomfortable in, in conversations is, is because of morality. And, you know, they can conversations can become uncomfortable with when we're trying to talk to somebody whose morals are wrong. 
you know, who, who are vastly different than the Judeo-Christian moral. You know, and, and so this one's a little tougher. Now, some of y'all are going to get uncomfortable if you're not already uncomfortable. But Jesus engaged this woman. This woman had been living an immoral lifestyle, really. I mean, it, it seems that, that, that that's the case anyway. There's definitely an implication here, but I think it's more than that. Jesus intentionally told her, said, go call your husband. Where'd that come from? You know? I think it's because Jesus wanted her to see who she was, and he wanted her to know who he could make her uh, to be. See, God has called every one of us. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life uh, uh, to make you into a beautiful creature that loves and serves God and lives out a calling and a gifting that he's given you specifically for your life. But when we choose to live our lives our way in spite of what God has designed us for, there are going to be problems. And Jesus knew that this woman was wasting her life. And he deeply loved her. And he wanted to confront her in her sin and give her an opportunity to be changed. And that's what he has for all of us, isn't it? And so he says, go call your husband. And a woman said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yep, you've had five husbands. and You're currently living with a man that's not your husband. So then she knows he's a prophet. He, he knows stuff that, that nobody else knows. And so, look... This is going to be uncomfortable. But, you know, it's popular today for people to live together as husband and wife and, you know, without being married and, and, and you know, let's define marriage. Well, people want to talk about no papers and this and that. But, you know, and I've talked about marriage. Listen, biblical marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's for life. And it's a covenant between that man, that woman, their community, and their God. If you've not made a vow or commitment to God public, you're not married. I don't care if there's papers involved or not, okay? Let's just throw the papers aside. It at least has to be that. And we got, so today there's people saying, oh, if, if you have sex with somebody, then you're married. And, and you're married for life. Well, uh, no, you're not. Really? I mean, you know, I, where does that come from? I mean, uh, but, 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 but. Now here's this woman. She's obviously looking for love in all the wrong places, right? I mean, she, she, she can't find peace or happiness. And she keeps looking in the same way. She's looking for a man who can fulfill her and satisfy her. And, and you know, and, and this kind of thing. And, and, and uh, you know, listen. The same things are going on today for so many people, isn't it? Sexual immorality is at an all-time high. Divorce is easy. Uh, but listen, let me tell you something. There, and there's nothing that breaks my heart more than seeing two people who say they love Jesus in a church together divorce. I hate it. God said he hates divorce. I hate it too. And I've seen more than my fair share of it. And, and I just do, for the life of me, I cannot understand. Somebody help me understand how Two people who say they are committed to one another and committed to God can divorce so easily and walk away from one another. Well, I'll tell you what. The only way you can do it is you're not committed to God. And you're not willing to do the right thing. And I'm not saying there's not some grounds for divorce. There is. I mean, it, it comes and goes. And look, you know, some people may decide to leave our church, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. They don't care how uncomfortable it makes you. That's the truth. Look at what the Bible says about marriage. A man and woman are committed to one another for life. For better or for worse. Go back and read your vows. Marriage is tough. Life is tough. But God loves us. He has a plan for you. Let's give it to Him. And that wasn't my plan to preach on divorce today. But this woman been divorced five times. It's in there, ain't it? I mean, so... It's your responsibility, husband or wife, to love your spouse and to give them and bless them to be Jesus to them. And when you're not getting your side of it and you're not satisfied, 
Jesus don't walk away, thank God. He doesn't walk away from us. We are the bride of Christ, and he has committed to us, and he's going to be faithful to us forever. Amen? That's good news. And our relationships with our spouses are supposed to emulate that marriage. And um, this is an uncomfortable conversation, I know. But this is just the truth of it, you know. And, and it's, not, it's not just divorce. I mean, like I said, sexual immorality today is so rampant and, and pornography. And, and, and sometimes it's difficult. You know, one of the hardest conversations for me to have with people, a lot of times, especially men, when, when they come to me. But, I'll, you know, some of them may not ever come to me again, but a lot of times they come to me, they got this problem. And I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask, do you have a problem with pornography? Because uh, a lot of times that's the problem. You know, and that's the core of the problem. And, and it's not just men today. It's, it's women too a lot of times. And, and it, it, it's, an, it's epidemic. And it, 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 it destroys our minds and our hearts so much. And, and, um, but anyway, Jesus intentionally asked this woman about her husband so he could engage her in this uncomfortable topic. And so what happens is when you bring Jesus into a conversation about sin, his light shines, right? Remember in John chapter 3? Everybody knows John chapter 3 and verse 16, don't they? Uh, I think we got, got it here. But I want us to look at a few of those verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So Jesus didn't come to condemn came to save. He didn't come to condemn that woman, and I'm not here to condemn you. I want you to be saved. I want you to experience the blessings of God and, and the life that God has for you. But look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned because they've not believed in the name of the only Son of God. They've not believed. They're already condemned. because They've not believed. And verse 19 says this is judgment. That light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. When you're in sin, you don't want to have these uncomfortable conversations because the light exposes your sin and you don't want out of your sin a lot of times. That's the world. And if you're in a church and you say you're a Christian and that's the way you behave, then maybe you don't know the Lord. You know? If you don't want out of your sin, something's wrong. I'm telling you, something is wrong. If you're satisfied... To sin. And that's what he says. People love the darkness rather than the light. Look what it says in verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, let his works, that lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true, whoever does what is right, comes to the light so that they may clear, be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Oh, man. So I think a lot of times, you know, we avoid those conversations with people about their sin. And you got to be careful. It's a hard thing. Sometimes people just need to be encouraged to open up and confess their sin. You know? It's the only way they'll be made right. And, and Jesus has a way to do this that, that maybe we don't have. But you can't be saved until you recognize you're a sinner. You know, and so we just give them the truth. Give them Jesus. You know? <laughs> Give them hope in Jesus. I'm not saying judge them and ostracize them for their sin. I'm talking about lovingly helping them find deliverance from their sin in Jesus and the peace and joy that comes from a lifestyle of uncompromised obedience to Christ. That's what we all need. You need it, and I need it. <laughs> oh, man. So these are three reasons conversations can be uncomfortable. And I mean, they came right from the text. I think you can see them. And it's why a lot of times we avoid conversations with people who really need Jesus. There are some of these reasons, maybe some more. But, but when you love people, you tell them the truth. Don't you? you know, if you really love somebody, you tell them the truth. And you got egg on your face. You know? You got broccoli in your teeth. You also have sin. In your heart. You know. Tell them. You know. 
Remember King David's friend Nathan? If you can turn back to 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 12 in Scripture, and you can read this story if you want. I'm going to head on it a little bit. We're, we're out of time. But now look at verse 1 of 2 Samuel 12. It says, David, let me set it up. David had sinned with Bathsheba. You know, the whole story. He had had Uriah killed. Some time had passed. And one of David's best friends was Nathan. And Nathan comes to David. But why? Look, the Lord sent Nathan to David. And then he tells him a story. Before we get to verse 5, he tells him a story. He tells him a story about a rich man and a poor man. And the poor man had one little sheep. He treated it as his daughter. He brought it up in his home. He petted it. You know, I mean, he just, just a little pet sheep, you know. And, and, and he loved it deeply. And the rich man, he had more sheep than he could count. But he had a visitor come. And he decided to take the sheep from the poor man and slaughter it so that he could feed his guests. <laughs> notice David's response. Remember, David was a shepherd, right? So you know this, this got to him. David's ang David was angry, and it was, he, he was greatly kindled. His anger was greatly kindled against his man. And he said to Nathan, he says, The Lord lives. This man who's done this deserves to die. <laughs> and then he says, And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And look at verse 7. Nathan said to David, he said, David, you are the man. He had illustrated the sin of David for him. Thank God David reacted correctly. He loved his friend for telling him the truth. He repented of his sin. He called out to God and he said, God, he asked God to remove his sin and iniquity from him, restore the joy of his salvation. He pleaded to God. In Psalm 32, you can read it. And, and, and so, thank God, God was able to use David after this, uh, you know, to do, do a lot of things because he was willing to repent of sin. Today, maybe, maybe it's you or me that needs to repent of sin. You know, you think his conversation was uncomfortable for David when he realized that Nathan was talking about him? That man deserves to die. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what we all deserve. But Jesus has made a way for us to be saved. Why did Jesus have this conversation with this woman? Because he wanted to bring her to redemption. You know, the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to condemn, but to save. He didn't come. Listen, Jesus didn't come on a seek and destroy mission. You know, it, the Bible doesn't say the Son of Man came to seek and destroy the lost. He came on a seek and save mission. He came to seek and save the lost. And he didn't approach in a holier-than-thou way, even though, well, he was, you know. He approached humbly and gracefully and lovingly. He did everything with a redemptive touch. And, and, and we should too. You know, and I, I've said some hard things today. And I know some of them have hit home. But I want you all to know I love you. I'm telling you because I love you. And I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to repent of sin. And I want you to find your joy in Him. Stop trying to find your joy in the things of this world. You won't find it. And you'll be miserable. Your joy is in Jesus. It's in Him. So this morning, and I just ask you, maybe today you need to see your sin and turn away from your sin. Turn to Jesus. I've given you, I've engaged you in an uncomfortable conversation. One-sided though, I know. But, but will you call out to Jesus for salvation today if you need it? If you're lost and without hope, will you call out to Jesus today and ask him for forgiveness and restoration? The Bible says if you do, if you confess your sins and call out.